So what I'm going to talk about, we hear so much about 61850. Now I see 61850 and what a fantastic thing it is and how it's going to solve all our problems in protection and control and automation and simplify things and you know make, make it easier to, to design and develop and configure systems going forward. But I want to spend some time talking about really, let's take a step back and take a look at what 61850 really means and what you can do with 61850. And you hear all these terms, you hear all these terms even about, you know, things in the industry, you know, logical nodes, self-description of data, goose messaging, process bus, stationed bus, sampled values, 1588, client server, VLANs, all these all these terms you hear. And the question becomes, the question you're always going to ask yourself is, so what do they mean? Right? What and you know, what does 61850 really do? And there's a lot of confusion. I mean, all of us have sat through papers at conferences where people talk about using a logical node to describe something and become, at the end of the day, the question becomes, so what does it mean to me? How does it, how does it make my job easier, better? Or does it make my job easier to better, right? You know, so what does 61850 really do? What does it mean? How can I use it? That's an important question for us. How can I use 61850 to, to, um, to do something? And should I use 61850 in my applications, right? And when I do this, do I need this? How much do I need to learn? What do I need to learn? You know, how would I do about networking? Do I need to learn computer science? Do I need to, pro, need to learn programming? And you know, how do I test 61850? So these are all questions that, that, that you should be asking yourself what to do going forward, right? And so what I'm going to talk about is give an overview of 61850 the way that I see it as to you know what we do, you know, um, what it can be done, right? And this is what I'm going to talk about. And as overview, I'm going to talk about concepts. I might define some terms, and I might not, right? So it depends on what we need to do, right? And I'm going to talk a little bit about using 61850 in some specific applications, mostly focus on protection because my background is a protection engineer. I'm not an automation guy. I'm not a controls guy. I'm not a computer, you know, I'm not a, a, a programming guy. Right? I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about, you know, what you can do and why you might do it, right? And you know what? It, you know a little bit about planning and implemented implementations. So I'm going to start with concepts. And to me, 61850, there are only two concepts that that are really encapsulated in the standard. The standard's huge. The standard is 10 parts. It's 1,200 pages long if you print it all out, right? But it really contains two concepts. And the first concept is we know a piece of information. Right? By knowing a piece of information, we know what this information represents, right? A phase current, right? Where it comes from, from feeder 12, right? And that we can trust this information, right? So that's what we know by know a piece of information. We, we, we know what it is, what it represents, what its source is, and that we can trust it, trust it and, and use it in our applications, right? And then once the other concept is once we know a piece of information, that we can share this piece of information with any other device on the system that's implemented 61850. And there's a couple ways to share this information, the, the publish describe model um, and MMS models, right? So those are the only two real concepts in 61850. Everything else in 61850 is, describes how we know a piece of information and how we share a piece of information, right? So the thing is, that's all 61850 defines, how we know it, how we share the information. What it does not do, it does not define what to do, right? It doesn't talk about applications. It doesn't talk about devices. It doesn't talk about architectures. It doesn't talk about any of that stuff, right? That's a user, de user decision as to what to do. You know, what it really, it, it just talks about what are the mechanisms for knowing and sharing information, right? And I, Talk to a guy in the industry, you describe 61850 as all nouns and no verbs, right? Because it all it talks about is what the, is how to do something, not what you can do with it. And I thought that's a pretty good description of what 61850 is. So look at IC 61850 itself. One of the other misconceptions, people call, a lot of people call 61850 a protocol, and it's not. It actually uses protocols to accomplish its task, but it's not a protocol. It's a standard that defines the, um, digital communications within a substation and how you actually accomplish that and the processes to make that happen, right? So look at the standard, I mentioned this before, it's 1,200 pages over 10 parts. It's it's also referenced by other standards and other technical reports published by AEC. It's dependent on other standards and technical reports, right? So it's a, it's a big thing, right? 
and it defines digital communications as substations, so the protocols, the data types, the message formats, but not the applications itself, right? One of the things about 61850, the long-term vision, not the reality today, but the goal, is interoperable devices at the 61850 communications level, meaning that you know, if I've implemented 61850 devices, I should be able to have these devices interoperate, talk to, connect to each other, right? Now, the important thing to re remember is interoperable and interchangeable are different things. And the standard is clear on this. The standard clearly states the goal is interoperability devices within the terms of 61850, not interchangeability. And you'll never see truly interchangeable devices. So what, what I'm talking about, if you look at a protective relay, all the communications pieces and the protection piece that are based on 61850 will be, that'll be interoperable among devices, but the relay is still going to contain protection functions, you know, user logic configuration that's not going to be defined 60 by 61850 is not going to be interoperable. Inter, you know, so it's not going to make, means it's not going to be interchangeable with other devices of the same type. So look at the parts of the standard. So there's, you know, like I said, there's 10 parts of the standard that do um, certain things. I'm going to reference parts of these standards as, as we go through. Um, you know, but it's structural and past experience. So it's trying to break the standard of the manageable chunks, knowing it's big pieces. What are certain roles, responsibilities? What does it do, right? So really, that's more important stuff, right? So in one of these parts of the standards, and I think it's part five, the standard defines, you know, different communications interfaces and different levels of um, process, uh, different levels of stuff, what a bad word, stuff in the substation, right? But it talks about devices being at the station level, the bay unit level, the process level. And it defines for these devices, the communications interfaces between devices at a level and between uh, devices at different levels. So the numbers are different types of communications interfaces and what kind of data you would, you would send there, right? So look at these levels. You know, to me, the, the, the heart of everything is the bay slash unit level. This is where relays sit. This is where meters sit. This is where bay controllers sit, stuff like that, right? And this is the basic, you know, for, for a bay and a unit, this is where we basic units of protection, protection and control. So we see these interfaces defined as, you know, for specific bay, there's an interface through its communication between protection and control devices that, you know, and then interface A is communications between different um, devices at different bays at this level, right? The station level is station level devices like gateways, um, automation controllers, and so on. And that's going to interface up to the wider system outside the substation and to the bay devices. And then the process level devices is at the primary equipment level, you know, CTs, VTs, breakers, etc and the process control of, of those devices, right? So these are all the defined interfaces. No one really pays that close attention to them other than, you know, their requirements for each one of these interfaces is the, the standard, right? So like I said, bay level is these bay level devices, relays, bay controllers, the communication between bay level devices in the same bay, and the communications between, you know, devices in, in, in um, bay level devices. The station level devices is all these station level um, products, gateways, and so on, automation controllers, interlock, you know, in, in, interlocking logic and, and stuff like that. And the process level devices are our primary equipment and the status control and measurement of this primary equipment. And then, uh, so there's two terms that are commonly thrown around the industry, which is station bus and process bus. And you go flipping through those 10 parts and 1200 pages of standard, you will not see those words defined anywhere, right? There are common usage words that are intended to help us understand basic application concepts. So station bus normally defines all the communications at the bay level, between devices at the bay level, between bays at the bay level, and the, between the station level equipment, the gateways, automation controllers, stuff like that. And that's commonly defined as station bus and the communications at that level, right? process bus and it's the interfaces interfaces four and five between bay level devices and primary process level so if you look at an architecture another way to look at this is look at an architecture right that we have this interface which happens at the bay level so up here we have the station level station bus stuff we're going to do goose messaging we're going to do client server and controls this way i'm going to do reporting and things like that i'm going to interface to the wider world and then i have the process bus level i'm going to enter process bus 
I'm going to interface the primary equipment through merging units, remote I.O. modules, process interface units, and the like, right? So, so one of the things we have to look at, when we go look at 61850 and what to do with it, right? So I've gone past the basic definitions now. So I got these basic terms out of the way, I've done these definitions. And if I go look at what this means, you know, what, you know, what, you know, ever so looking at, so what do I want to do with 61850 and should I use it? How would I use it? And so on and so forth. So let's take a look at some system communication requirements. So I started with a very, with an example and, you know, it may or may not make sense to some of this, but I took what I, what a, what a, a typical um, line bay you see more outside of North America than in double bus, single breaker line bay, right? And if you start looking at what we have to do in this line bay, you can break this down into two big, you know, uh, different groups of, of information. One's for protection, which has its own specific requirements, and one's for operations, which has its it, which has its own specific requirements. And if we look at this, and this is the way we've operated for years. We know there's a protect, you know, most utilities work with a protection group and a, a control operations automation group, which are separate that have separate requirements because they do have separate separate requirements, right? So we look at this. So we start looking at protection information, right? What information do we need? We need to, you know, measure currents and voltage for protection purposes. And we have things like tripping, um, closing, blocking permissive status signals, right? You know, anything that can be done with a contact output normally is, is, is a key protection information plus the measurement of currents and voltages for this. And of course, the protection information for, for these reasons has some requirements. High reliability because I send a trip circuit. You know, I want to send a trip circuit signal, and my circuit breaker needs the trip, and it needs to happen, right? Because I'm trying to clear a fault in my system. I want low latency of communications because I want to have this happen as fast as possible, and I want these communications to be deterministic so I can predict how it's going to respond, right? And that's one of the things. Because, like I said, I'm a protection engineer. And that's the way I think that I have. You know, I have to clear a fault within some certain amount of time for system stability purposes, right? Okay, operations has a, a, a different requirements, right? They don't, they're not doing, you know, necessarily mission critical information, but they're doing important information on the operation of the power system. They're reporting, they have to do control, they have to do interlocking, a lot of the traditional SCADA functions, you know, that, you know, I don't need to be high speed and determinism isn't an absolute requirement, though it's low latency aren't absolute requirements, though it's nice. The requirements I really have is that I, that every action I take is verified and then I can trust the information I'm getting. I can trust the performance and what I'm seeing, right? So, so there are slightly different requirements. And when you go through and look at applications, you have to figure out how I'm going to deliver these slightly different requirements. So this is one of the first challenges we look at 61850. 61850 doesn't distinguish between these two because what I described for protection and operations is application requirements. And 61850 doesn't talk about application requirements. They talk about how to do things, right? You know, so the first challenge is, since they don't distinguish between protection operations, how do I meet those performance requirements for protection operations? Now I'm going to use the same network and maybe the same devices to do this. And what does that, what does it matter? So let's take, you know, let's figure that out, right? What do we, what, what can be done? So, so the, the, to understand what can be done, we have to understand a little bit how 61850 works, right? So I talk about 61850 is, you know, the two concepts are you can know a piece of data because you know it, you can share that data, right? So the thing is, so how does 6150 work? How do I do that, right? How does 6150 know, how do I know a piece of data and share it, right? So what 6150 works on is functional modeling of the power system, right? So I do a functional model of the power system. I can break a substation down into component functions that have in the power station. The function may be, you know, you know, instantaneous overcurrent protection. It may be reclosing. It may be um, uh, uh, isolator switch control. It, it can be reporting, right? Some function that I do. And then it works on self-description of data that I can put, when I send the data, I can put a description of the data in the message that says, this is, you know, a phase current from the feeder 12 relay and it, that it's, that I can trust it, right? Um, and then there's application-based transmission of data there's the publish subscribe model for right now data that I that I want to get through right now and use right now and use immediately, right? And there's the client servant model 
for must trust data, right? That I want to trust what's going on and that I'm knowing this data. Now, of course, I want to trust all, all the data, but you know, publish subscribers work on, I got to do it, got to do it now, 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 now. I'm impatient, got to have it right now. And client services, I, it needs to happen, it needs to happen now, but I need to make sure that it happened, understand, understand it did happen, right? And the other basic of 61850, for all the configuration, description, documentation, configuration, it's based on XML, right? So in XML, so it's XML, so it's a text-based, you know, um, you know, extensible markup language, what XML stands for, version of this. So it's, you know, the description is understandable, so anybody can look at a description and understand what's going on, as long as you should follow the rules of 61850. So those are the basics. So let's talk about logical nodes, functional modeling of data. So I did something simple, right? I took a, a feeder relay. I'm gonna, for our case, it'd be like an F60, one of the URs, but I took a feeder relay. I got it hooked up, it's protecting feeder 12, so it needs to measure currents, it measures voltage from the bus, it measures currents from, from here, it knows the status of the breaker, it can control the breaker, right? And if I look at all the functions this, this relay can do, you know, I start going through functions. It samples currents, it samples voltages, it knows the breaker status. It can measure currents and measure voltages by, um, um, once I've sampled those, right? I do these all these protection functions, phase and neutral protection functions as a simple distribution feeder, right? I do breaker control, so I can open and close the breaker. I can do reclosing, and there's actually tons more functions you can do in an F60 or any microprocessor feeder relay, right? Once you define those functions, remember I said functional modeling of a power system, right? That all logical nodes is functional modeling of power system functions, right? And you start looking at, so those logical nodes, sample currents is TCTR, sample voltage is TVTR, breaker status, XCBR, right? So the first, and, and these are all logical nodes that, the, that map functions. The first letter of the logical node defines the class that it is. And the rest, the last three letters of the logical node define which logical node it is. So P is always protection, M is always measurement, R is always protection-related functions. But if you look at this, and if and you've you know been to college, at an engineering degree, even you know in electrical engineering, computer engineering, the last say 15 years, you go, oh look, object-oriented programming. I know what this is. For guys like me that are you know a little bit older than that, well we understand that, but we grew up with Fortran, so it's a little bit harder for us, but. But there it is. It's you know it's, it's, you're turning power system, right? So look at self description of data, right? And this is one of the big things for sixty one eight fifty. This is one of the it, you know advantages of what we're used to with you know DNP or or one hundred three slash one hundred four and other protocols like that. Is you know in, in the the old register based protocols we didn't know what a piece of data was. We knew the value. 473, but we didn't know what that, but we didn't know what that value was. We had to go basically to a lookup table, which is the device description because it's a, you know, an F60 and it's my bus address, whatever that register means, a phase current, but we didn't know that, right? And every device put it in a different register and you did all this remapping and rework. Well, self description of data says, you know, if we know something about the device, we know which device it's coming from. It's some relay, right? And then inside this device, this device may have different functions or different pieces, or we make relays that have multiple relays at one, that there's some, you know, internal, you can segment the device even more, right? And then um, going farther, then we look at the function, what function are we doing? And we look at the type of data and the data itself, right? If, you know, if we know all this information, we know what this data is, right? And we can do this. And and if we can append it to the message, we can describe what this piece of data is. And this piece of data uses objects to do this. So, you know, under self-description, there's a physical device, there's a device name, there's a logical device, which is, you know, a virtual device inside of this physical device. There can be multiple of those. There's a logical node, which is a function. There's a data class, which is a type of data. And there's an attribute, right? And then there's the data itself, right? And that's all self-description means. I'm gonna append to my data somewhere in the message, I'm gonna append all these these five parts in some way to describe what it is, and then it, and then the value itself becomes now we know what the value represents. I know that piece of information. Sorry. Another example, you know, um, device location feeder twelve once again logical device six, which I'm using to control dot xcbr, which is a control circuit breaker uh, control dot st. It's a status attribute dot another to define it even more. It's a position, and my position is going to be open or closed, right? you know, which defines this data. So back to the logical nodes, I said this before, I'm gonna say it again, right? It defines, 
you know, it's an abstract model of a real device or function. So XCBR is a circuit breaker, or SYN is um is sinker check, Y is power equipment and a power transformer. And this model includes the data, the data attributes, and even the behavior. So you look at logical node information categories, and you go through the standard. I think this comes in part seven of the standard. All these different information categories in a logical node, and, and um, um, you know what includes common logical node information. So it's object-oriented programming, so it inherits things from the basic class itself, just like object-oriented programming and higher levels of hierarchy inherited things from classes. There's status information. There's settings, which can be related to the logical node. There's you know potentially measured values. There's controls. All these different type of logical node information categories, right? So this one's a pretty famous picture that, you know, it's just the earliest things you want to float around to help define this, right? If I go back to my self-description, physical device dot logical device dot logical node dot functional constraint, which is the type of, you know, data that's coming out of it, dot, you know, the type type of data. So I'm looking at, you know, cur excuse me, current and voltage and even farther ago attributes if it's phase A or whatever, right? It's intuitive standardized object. Look at the circuit breaker model. Once again, there's the logical node. There's the type of data, which is position, right? There's the data attribute, right? So what it is. So we have under position, we could have, you know, the the value, the um, operating time of when it happened, the source of it, the, the sequence number of when the control happened, right? We can actually position as a status value. Q is the quality flag, right? It says, do I trust the data or not? And, and I'm not going to talk a lot about quality flags, though I probably should, right? T is the timestamp, for example, of when the, when this position, you know, this change of state happened, right? Now for now, exception because everyone wants the metering data, so you just put them all, right? So once again, if I expand this. I expand this logical node. I mentioned this briefly. So you can add a descriptive prefix up front to say something about it, right? You know, what does it really represent? And you can add an instance number at the back because they have multiple logical nodes in the in the um in the, in the same device, right? And then I can add the functional constraint, which is dot mx, which means it's a form of metering data. They have data items in different, right? which keeps spanning up these data items. So I can use some common data class, which is Y. And under the Y common data class, I have these pieces of data. You can do phase A, phase B, phase C, neutral, um, net, residual, right? And then I can say um, instantaneous value and a value, right? And value is a complex value, and that can be float. And then I get an instantaneous value. I can have magnitude and angle, right? So under this MMXU, I can define MMXU.MX. Uh, PHV, which makes it a phase voltage, right? Dot PHA, which is phase A. Dot instant C value, which is instantaneous, and it's it, it's um it's a instantaneous phasor data as opposed to an RMS value essentially. Dot magnitude, so I know the magnitude of the voltage, or I can send the voltage angle, right? You know XCBR dot L dot ST val, you know dot you know, dot st, dot st val, and then I know what the value is, true or false. And then, you know, in configuration and mapping, of course, is once it's described in one location, it's known and mapped to all locations. I never have to remap. It's always a phase current. You know, once I self-describe this data, every device knows it's a phase current coming from feeder 12, right? It doesn't matter if the device is another relay, it's a bay controller, it's a gateway, it's a fault recorder, it's my EMS system, you know, or DMS system sitting in my central office. And these functional models all depart to find in standards part 701, 73, and 704, just describing the common data classes, the attributes, and the logical nodes, right? And the individual logical nodes. And what either, as I mentioned at the start, right, that 61850 is not a protocol, it uses protocols to do its work. And one of the protocols it uses is basic Ethernet, raw Ethernet to, to transmit data. And this is do, and it uses raw Ethernet and the publish describe model for two, you know, basic important things, right? And so publish describe is a multicast way of sending data, right? It's very simple and very fast, and it's very good for sending right now data. Publish describe. So what we do, we have this data 
in this feeder relay. My feeder 12 relay, I talked about the examples of phase A current and the status of circuit breaker. And other devices need this piece of data, right? So in the old days, we'd hardwire it. Output contact, the input, and we connect the relay to a, an RTU or a gateway to get the data out, right? In the 6150 way, we do this a different way. We can publish this data to the network. So I can publish it out, put it on the network, and any device on the network can subscribe to this data and use it, right? So that's why it's called publish, subscribe, it as multicast. And it's kind of like me talking here, right? I'm talking out, and if you're paying attention and, you know, and understanding what I'm saying, or even trying to understand what I'm saying, then you're subscribing to the data I'm publishing, right? If you're checking email, you know, or, you know, or whatever, then you're not subscribing. It's the exact same model. Now, the only requirements, of course, when you publish describe that devices that subscribe to this have to implement the same logical nodes, data classes, and data attributes to understand what the data really is, right? But it's very simple. I'm gonna push this all out to the network and anybody can use it, right? So I'm not sending it to a specific other device. I'm putting it on the network and you can figure the other devices say, if I want that data, here's, I know how to get it, right? So I look at publish describe and define data types. You know, if I look at data types, there's peer-to-peer -peer messaging, which is Goose, which uses publish describe, right? So I have two devices that can talk to each other data. I have instantaneous sampled values that I use in process bus, so I can sample current and voltages to recreate phasers or do recording and so on for this, which uses publish describe, very simple raw data. Now we look at other information on the client server messages for HMI, for control, like reporting, like metering data, does not use publish describe. It use, actually uses uh, MMS and client server methods to do this. It's a little little different, right? So, but, you know, but basically I'm still putting this data out where anybody can get it and I'm not establishing, you know, a permanent connection or addressing or always, always sending the data one way used, right? And why I say Ethernet is important, right? So if I look at, you know, the definition of Ethernet, right? And looking at, you know, you know, the either type 8802, either that either type, right? That, you know, all of these things get defined somewhere in here, right? Sampled values is multicast, sampled values, right? Goose is event driven, which is defined in the same either type, right? You know, generic object, Goose stand, by the way, for generic object oriented substation event. I'll talk about Goose a little more. Time synchronization is defined in here and, and streaming data. So like IEEE 1588, we're hearing about as a way to time synchronization over an Ethernet network which is coming, right? And then for more control stuff, we have um, um, core services, ACSI, uh, abstract communication service interface, how we do control, and we've mapped things into these control, right, which uses more of the Ethernet profile. Or we look at Ethernet interface layers, you know, starting from physical link, physical layer, link layer, network layer, transfer layer, all these up, you know, trying to map Ethernet into the seven layer stack, which Ethernet doesn't necessarily map into the OSI seven layer stack, right? You can see these different layers, but the physical layer and the link layers where switches work, routers go to you know, the network layer, right? And then gateways go all up the application layers and stuff we do on it. But basically, you know, when I look at the link layer, we don't use IP addressing to send stuff, we use MAC addressing, right? And you know, the, at, the, at the network layer, we have to start to use app, uh, IP addressing to make it work and there's kind of a cutoff. So at the layer, link layer, we can just put stuff out quickly we don't have to, you know, use IP address. And this is where Goose resides. And, you know, I'm at Ethernet, I'm at layer two, raw Ethernet stuff. I'm doing with Goose, and raw Ethernet means, of course, it can only be switched, it cannot be routed, so it stays inside the substation. Routers don't know, know, know what to do with layer two only, only stuff. There's no IP address. So a router gets it, it throws the message into the bit bucket, which is basically the garbage can, so you can only use this. Right? And we use it for Goose because Goose is a simple event. It's a multicast message. Goose stands for Generic Object Oriented Substation Event. Right. So what this means is a Goose message is only, is only published and uses a publish describe model. It is only published if one of the data set items changes state. Okay. And I'll talk about changing state. Right. And you know, it's, you know, I'm going to publish the network as a multicast message. So any device describing that Goose message can understand it's there and get the data, right? But Goose works does not work in acknowledgement. It does not acknowledge that you received the data and establish a connection. The way reliability is determined is by message repeat. 
So what it, so what Goose does, it sends the message, right? And then it, it, it immediately repeats the message a few times. And the, the time interval between treats expands out up to a setting, which is the heart, which is the, um, the, the lifespan of the Goose setting, right? So I'll continue to retrans this mess retransmit this message to make sure it gets received. You know, the first time it may not get there, but the second time, second or third time will definitely get um, received. And it's defined for fast delivery, you know, the millisecond range, the standard says from when the, the message is created to what's uh, decoded the receiving device for protection purposes should be three milliseconds or less, right? Okay. Now one of the things is we never know. So one of the challenges is, if we look at this, let me look at Goose messages is because I'm just publishing it multicast and there's no acknowledgement that it's been received that and it only gets published when it change there's a change of state in any one of the date values of data set items that Goose messages may not be published right and you're receiving your subscribing device doesn't hear from you in a while starts to get wonder what goes on right the subscribing device may actually disable this Goose message saying there's something wrong with the device. So what happens is a heartbeat message is sent every once in a while just to say, hey, I'm still here and my data hasn't changed. No, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, present, right? Kind of stuff. Now it looks at, when I talked about change of state, of course, you can put two kinds of, basic two kinds of data in a goose message. Binary values, right? You know, which is, you know, you know, and a change of state is, you know, true to false and false to true, right? On and off, that, that change of state as well as analog measurements. I can actually put, you know, phase or quantities, magnitudes of, of currents and voltages or angles of currents and voltages in there. And of course, the change of state is when those value changes greater than the configured dead band, right? And I'll talk about um, dead band in a little bit, right? Now, goose messages are also very small, right? About 300 bytes long, only 20, you know, 24 bits of data, right? So there's no time on the wire, right? You know, you know, so I, so I can publish this, publish this quickly, publish it accurately, and it's you know it's great for this right now data, like protection operations data, tripping and blocking, and so on. Because I'm going to send it. I'm not going to wait for an acknowledgement to make sure it's there. I'm just going to send it. I'm going to retransmit it a bunch of times to make sure it's sent and received as intended to be fast. That's right. And if you look in the goose message, in the header of a goose message, you see things like the multicast address, the name of the message, so I know where it comes from, the number of data set items, the time until the next goose is expected, so the subscribing device knows when the I, I, I expect the next goose, how often this message was changed, how often is it repeated, the number of times the configuration of the goose message has changed, whether this is a test message or not, right? And so you can send goose messages that are test data that can be, um, you know, you know, used to make sure I'll you know, test my system, right? And there's a used to find data set, which can find, you know, status information, analog values, data quality, quality flags, and um, time information. All right, so we're good so far, I hope. So I mentioned this before, but, but Goose is a layer two, MAC address only, destination MAC address only, so it's not routable, right? It's published without acknowledgement, you know, so for speed, don't wait, just send. You know, so reliability through retransmission, you know, here it is, 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 right? It's great for protection, right? Because I'm just publishing this. So the network design determines latency and the determinism and reliability more than the goose message does, right? So for operations, it's not as great, right? Because there's no acknowledgement. So I don't know the message has been sent and received and that things have changed state, you know? So I can't say, open the disconnect switch and have the disconnect switch open and say, the disconnect switch is open, right? Without sending a goose message to the controller for the disconnect switch and you're waiting for status changes to come back and it doesn't really work. There's no select before operate, there's no, you know, kind of stuff in there and, and, and goose messaging. So it's not so great for operations for when, you know, trusted verified stats, but it is great for protection because we want, you know, high speed up waiting for it to do. We just want to say, you gotta do it, gotta do it, right? You know, and, and goose is described in part eight of the standard. If you take a microprocessor relay or meter, right? You, you connect the primary system currents and voltages. You have your internal instrument transformers to step these things down to, to low voltages, normally, you know, 100 millivolt nominal, right? You run this through a low pass analog filter so I can get it into my A to D converter. And then I do digital filtering and I do some form of magnitude estimation. And our relays, we use a normally use a one cycle uh, discrete Fourier transformer, one cycle DFT, other people do different things, right? And then all a merging unit says is I take the front end of the relay out, 
right? And I put in a separate device, so I still have these internal inputs, so I still have my little pass filter, I still have my ADA converter, and I take the samples out of the ADA converter, package it up in a message, and transmit the message to samples, then my end device connects it, and my end device connects to it, takes those samples and does magnitude estimation however it does it, right? And then I can share this data with multiple devices and not just one hardwired connection. And it was called a merging unit because it really came up with the idea of how do I work with, you know, three phase non-conventional instrument transformers that have to merge the data together the same. This is defined in part nine of the standard, actually 9-1 has been withdrawn. It's defined in part 9-2 of the standard, how to define sample value data sets. So, though, so, though, so you look back there, so Goose is a layer two, and then sampled values is also layer two, because I'm simply, it's, once again, sampled values is also a multicast message that I'm publishing out. Once again, so it's a very simple layer two message, and it's a right now message. Now, the difference between uh, sampled values and Goose is the sampled values I do not retransmit, and, re, you know, and retransmit, I just continuously publish, right? And I publish with like, um, sample counters so the device can know which order messages come in and so on, right? Um, um, but, so, so there it is. Now to go to the next concepts, there are other things that are, that are important besides protection, which is operations. And I want to do things like, you know, trust and verify data. I want to do control and so on. And that's where MMS uh, comes in. It, MMS is a, uh, Machine message system, or I forget what it actually stands for, but it's developed actually in the automotive industry to do um, stuff, right? So, so one of the things that the 6150 define is ACSI, Abstract Communication Service Interface, which is generic communication services for trust and verified data, right? Data access, data accession reporting, control, control and device control and tagging, self-describing devices, event logging, and file access. And then MMS was developed for other industries. We mapped MMS and ACSI together to be able to do And so we look, look at some of the things we do with MMS. Okay, one of them. And that's where these services go on. So I want to be able to do this control stuff I want to be able to send a control command and make it operate. And I send a control command, I establish a connection to the device, send the control command, and get verification that it was received and accepted and acted upon. That's what they're looking for. So we look at MMS, provides connection between client and server. That's what it's really designed to do, right? It's, you know, this is a reporting, reporting and control. It provides acknowledgement for controls, right? So the goal is trust and verification. I want to establish a connection, send the command, and verify. It can be every bit as fast as goose messaging, right? The difference is, I you know, I send the mess command once, then I get verification that's been received, right? Which makes, you know, though the command and the execution of the command can be as fast as I would with goose messaging, I establish the connection to wait for a response back, and then I, I only resend that command when I get, when it's um. When I'm ready to get the response back. And MMS is described in standard part 8-1. Right? So some architecture thoughts to the date, right? Um, you know, I haven't got the architecture yet because, you know, we're talking a little about what 61850 does and how it works, right? But, you know, if you look at MMS and so on, how this means architecture-wise, they have an HMI client that we're going to have in our substation or may have in our substation, HMI and the clients themselves. Right, and I'm going to use this HMI client. I'm going to under, buffer report for metering and status, so I can go look at the HMI and see real time what's going on with my uh, with my uh, system and make operation decisions. Right, then I'm, it's going to be source of local control commands. I'm going to open and close a breaker, or open and close a disconnect switch, and so on. Maybe some logic and interlocking. Right, when gateway that might do that. Then might will do buffer reporting for meta metering, status, historical data, so I can send it to a historian, so I can send the data upstream to my DMS or EMS system. It'll be the source of remote control commands for my, my system operators and so on in client server, right? That I may do interlocking in my gateway if I have logic and so on. I may choose to do interlocking at this point. You know, interlocking maybe in bay controllers or somewhere else, right? That, you know, my relays and meters are going to be data servers because they're going to be a source of data for reporting and control commands, right? That um, relays and distributed I.O. may also be control points. This is all a function of, you know, how what my devices do and how they're configured, right? So, gone through 
you know, 61850, we can know a piece of data, we can share a piece of data. I've talked about Ethernet sum. I've talked about publish, describe, multicast model data for goose and sample values. I've talked about MMS slash client server for, you know, trust and verify status and control. So control, reporting, buffering, and so on, right? And, um, and the other thing to talk about, which is important, is configuration. Because I mentioned one of the tools, it, it, one of the parts of, you know, useful things of 61850 is you know, configuration using XML, right? About 61850. And what 61850 defines, the part six of the standard, this is all part six of the standard defines, is the substation configuration language, right? Common is a common description language configuring 61850 communications in all IEDs, all of them, right? And, um, and it's XML based. So it allows a formal description of the substation automation system and the switch shard in relation to be them between them. It's a description of ID configuration as related to 61850 and communications, right? It's defined in standard part six. So we can define the, the configuration of the entire substation and all the devices in it. Okay. And 61850 defines a bunch of file types, right? And they're all XML files that do different things and have different purposes and may be subsets of other files, right? Um, okay, and you know, we go through this the SSD file, which is a you know system specification description file, which describes the whole system. SCD files, the master file for a substation, the substation configuration description. It's the XML description of a single substation and everything in it, right? Everything, right? The ICD, IED capability description defines what is the descri XML description of what items are supported by an IED. So it's a, by, theoretically, it's a generic file that says, because this is an F60 of this order code, this is what my 6150 capabilities are. The CID file is an output which goes back to a relay or the device. It's a configured ID description. It actually comes out of the SCD file. So this is my configuration related to 61850. And then the second uh, version of, of, of uh, part six of the standard talks about an IID file, which is an instantiated ID description. It's an ICD file that's been instantiated um, um, that the uh, defines the device in some specific configuration for a specific version of the device, right? So somewhere in part six of the standard, this drawing, some people like this drawing, some people hate this drawing. I pull it to the standard because it's in the standard, we can talk about this, the drawing, right? But we're gonna start looking at the configuration process, right? The general view, and one of the things about 61850, and this is one of the challenges of 61850, is 61850, the vision has always been, because it's functional modeling of the power system, right? The vision has always been down, top-down functional design of the substation, right? And this is a big change for us because we're not used to thinking top-down functional design of the substation from the start. Now we do a general overall functional application design of the substation and lay that out one way and then, um, and then, um, you know, then we go break out the individual devices here, start configuring those. We can do some back and forth between, you know, high level overall and, and, and slower and working back and forth those ways. But we never think about top down functional design exclusively. This is a big conceptual change for how we do things, right? Um, now, if we go look at, um, in the 6150 world, so we start with, so we have this, so the goal is to produce the SCD file first. And to produce the SCD file, we have to do things, right? That we, um, you know, we have, um, SSD files and input, ICD files are an input, right? You know, SCD file, which I didn't talk about, is another form of file as an input. IID files can be inputs. And I do this system configuration, it configures the whole system in terms of 61850 goose messaging, sample, you know, process, sample value messaging, you know, client server does this configuration, right? And it produces an SCD file, which is the entire configuration. Right, and then my SCD file, I generally run this through my IED configurator to take the parts of the SCD file that I want, right? And also they do the private parts, the proprietary parts that are defined because it's a GE relay versus a Siemens relay that have to be in there, right? And then I'm gonna take that and produce, the output can be a CID file, which contains everything, or a CID file is only a 61850 part, and a, a vendor proprietary file that 
contains the rest of it. Our vetted proprietary file includes the CID part, right? But a CID is a subset of the SCD file specific for that device. And I'm going to load that into, um, into my devices to, to configure that, right? Sounds great. Um, of course, to me, there's a, there's a huge challenge with that. And the huge challenge becomes that the, um, you know, the SCD file becomes the master of everything. And it de defines the configuration or part of the configuration of all the devices in a substation. And there's a lot of questions to me about how that file gets maintained, who owns the file, who owns, you know, every device becomes a touch point to that file, how it gets updated, maintained, and, and configured, and so on, and how you have different groups working together, like protection and, and automation groups working simultaneously with the same stuff, how that really works out, right? That's pretty straightforward. And this is, you know, when I'm doing a complete substation with automation, you know, HMIs, control and everything, that this becomes important. Now, if I'm just doing things that are simple, right, like goose messaging only, particularly in small substations, which is a lot of application we do in protection, this is a lot of what we do is this goose messaging. I can skip a lot of that, right? I can do a lot of configuration of the device. I can take this device, I can configure the device, I can configure the goose message it's going to publish first, right? And then I'm going to produce these files, and then, um, right, which is my, you know, I, I don't necessarily have to go to a system configuration file, it make me optional. I can produce these files, and, and my ICD file that comes out of this relay is partially configured for 6150 because I've set the Goose Publishing it's going to do out. And then I can actually, you know, in my next device, in my next relay, use this ICD file as an input into this device to help to configure the device. I'm going to describe the these data set items from this messages and just configure it on a device by device basis. I don't have an SC, I don't have an SCD file as the master for everything. I just configure the individual devices. Now 61 and 50 purists, and I brought this up to bring a conference paper, will 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 blanch at this. They think this is heresy that you don't have an SCD file for the whole substation. My response is why do that master stuff when I'm going to configure a handful of devices simply to do goose messaging? It doesn't make sense and I can do it faster just, you know, with just Goosemith, I can do it faster by configuring the devices normally than I can doing the, the master thing. When we look at applications, this channel is ideal for 61850. One of the first ones is replacement of field wiring, right? You know, and if you look at field wiring, the design and installing commissioning, field wiring is where we spend a lot of time on protection and control systems. And it's, you know, meaningless grunt work that has a high, you know, takes a lot of effort. You know, it takes a lot of work in the field. It has high error rates when I, it's designed it, installed, it has to be fixed, right? You know, if I can replace field wiring with communications, I can get rid of a lot of that, right? Relay panel design and relay, relay signals, that's goose messages is designed for. Application design, device configuration, device replacement. So one of the things about microprocessor devices is they don't last 40 years like the primary equipment. They last 10 to 15 years and I have to replace them, right? So if I have a make this replacement project easier, that also helps as well, right? So these are I challenges that are ideal for 6150. The question is, should we do that? You know, besides, you know, the generic benefits, you look at peer-to-peer -peer application, the goose, this is all like protection right now stuff, right? I can get rid of control wire, I can do all these things, in combination of these things. You know, I don't want to go through this whole list, but see, that's an easy list of stuff that can be done, right? And some of these are, you know, do things better because I, you know, I don't have to hardwire, like break or failure initiate, right? You know, kind of stuff. Main time, main automatic transfer schemes get better doing this way. You know, other things I can do applications that are simply a better way of doing it, which I don't think it was on here, which is things like paralleling transformers using VAR flow, you, by goose mesh between the transformer control, you know, the low tap changer controllers, than the old way of using circulating current, right? So, they give you some of the examples of stuff that can be done with this, right? And there's a couple examples starting here. Zone sequence interlock breaker failure, right? Auto transfer schemes, fast load shedding, process bus application, suggestions for smart switching. Someday this substation is going to be expanded, expanded I'm going to add another feeder or two. I can actually configure the substation such as the other two feeder relays exist, even when they don't. Because I know the feeder relay names, and I know what goose messages are gonna gonna have to be there, so I can so I can actually describe my configuration and have it already in the configuration for installed. I mentioned the relays get installed. I just have to load in the configuration for it. 
main time may automatic transfer schemes right so once again another good protection or this is actually an automation application normally from the industrial world where we have two sources feeding buses with a normally open, one of these three breakers is normally open right and then if i lose one of the incoming main sources i'm going to transfer everything off that one bus section onto the other source normally the two incoming mains are closed and the ties normally open so i'd open this open this tie and close the main right and there's all these requirements in terms of i have to win you know if I lose the source, can I actually transfer the other source and send those status and control commands back and forth? And we've done a lot of work as our relays where they have predefined programs that are based on hardwiring output contacts, right? And what you can do with 61850 is you goose messaging to send all this information as opposed to multiple output contacts between relays, including status of the breaker, am I ready to transfer, should I transfer, and so on, right? And goose messaging. And once again, if I go back to my configuration, you know, my main relay has to subscribe the goose message coming from the other two relays, publish goose message containing information and ready to transfer and should I, you know, close tie and trip tie commands. Both mains do similar things. The tie relay is, you know, it publishes stuff, information is ready and so on, right? You know, I can do these in one goose message, multiple messages, but I'm publishing goose messages and subscribing the goose messages to send this data back, right? You know, and it, lots of advantages of doing it, obviously, that, you know, the um, there's no wiring design to change. If I want to do slightly different flavors from my specific application, it becomes all done in relay logic and configuration, right? Fast load shed. Now, this is a place where 61A50 makes a difference in the world because it allows us to do an application better and simpler and faster than we've done in the past, right? So fast load shed is the whole idea uh, we're working in an industrial plant that has some local generation that if I have problems that I lose my tie to utility that I may have to shed load to maintain my load generation versus load balance right and I may just shed my load in an organized way to shed non-critical and non-vital loads first to keep my plant and plant process up and running for safety reasons for loss you know material loss reasons cost reasons whatever right so that's you know that's the basic things in a power system you know in our AC power system that generation and, and um, Capacity and demand have to be balanced for it to work. When I lose my utility tie, then I may not have a generation, so my maybe out of balance, I have to shed some load, right? And so if I look at the, like the end data units, I have goose messages that's sending status and power information, you know, back to the shed commands. This is subscribing to the shed commands in my end devices, right? You know, so I can sit there and you know know what to do, and I, I may not, you know, I subscribe to it, but I may only use only one of these data set items may impact me, but basically I'm publishing, once again, it's good, so publish and scribe between the controllers and the other devices. And uh, um, so that's, you know, that's good stuff, right? And if you look at what Goose Messaging does for you, it allows you to um, um, do this faster and cheaper, right? And we know, when IEDs are offline and not communicating, right? It's easy to set up and configure. It just makes something we've been doing for years better because it's simpler, faster, easy to configure, and, and so on, right? So there's, so there's, you know, some Goose applications. So I want to talk a little bit about process bus applications because this is another another place where there's a lot of value, right? And the value in process bus applications becomes in field wiring and field terminations, right? Particularly transmission, where we spend a lot of time mucking them out with field wiring, right? We install breakers and CTs. We have to pull all these multi-conductor copper cables and install them. And here they are, you know, installed on our system. And, um, and um, so here's guys wiring, you know, and look, breaker cabinets look like spaghetti. We don't want to do that. We don't want cable trenches full of cables, right? And look like, once again, look like spaghetti the ground. Place this all with process bus. Manufactured the whole system. And once again, it's the benefit of 61850. I can test my whole protection and control system in a, in my manufacturing environment before I send it to the site so it's pretty ready to connect, right? I can reduce the outage time during refurbishment. I can reduce the engineering effort per feeder, right? This is, you know, this is one of the great things about process bus. We can get rid of stop doing wiring. We can stop mucking around with designing and installing wiring and having our engineers or expensive, highly skilled resources 
checking wiring diagram, which is a boring, you know, I say boring is wrong, but tedious thing that has to be done right now. We're going to focus on what they're good at, which is application design and, you know, making sure the protection and control system does what we want and operates the way we want, right? And then project execution, you know, re, you know reduced errors subsequent to the fact because we tested most of it, right? Less time on site and, you know, better, easier course. Then applications we can do with process bus, distant transformer protection. This is a, a common industrial application where we have a transformer between two switchgear rooms at different voltage levels. When you do transformer protection, the relay is located in one switchgear section. CTs the other side are 500 or 1,000 feet away. And now we're concerned about um, how do I send trip commands to both ends and also CT saturation, right? You know, the process bus, you know, you can use goose messaging to do this. It's pretty straightforward. Assuming there's a trip device that can accept goose messages. And the other challenge is CT saturation, right? That I may have to run bigger than number 10 copper, like number two copper, but uh, you know, it's expensive and difficult to use, but it does work, right? The process bus can do it. So we talked about process bus, you know, status and control, instantaneous sampled value, status and control of uh, currents and voltages. And before, we well, can use some architecture relays at, at one point, process interface units to have, you know, merging as a contact out of the same device, like the GE hard fire, right? And then I can put these bricks in both switchgear rooms, put a relay somewhere, maybe in a separate room from the, separate room from the switchgear, right? And then I use fiber out to connect it to bricks, and that's so I can do this complete protection. I don't worry about CT saturation. I can do remote tripping from one end to the other, right? The bricks are wired into these breaker breaker sections identical on both sides, irregardless of voltage, right? You know, so they're wired the same. So my CTs are wired in, my breaker control, my breaker status is wired in, you know, fiber that communicates to the panel, right? There I go, right? And once again, I can expand this by putting the relays in a separate room from the switch gear, because I don't have to pull like tons of copper wiring. I can simply pull fiber between it, you know, and quickly connect the fiber. Right, other applications, capacitor bank protection, right? Where I can, you know, if I I can install bricks, I don't have to necessarily install them in the field. I can install them in uh in panels if I've already run the I've already I've already for for, for um um benefits. I can do transmission line protection, set A and set B protection, right? Different algorithms, and if I do this right. And if I design my system right, as we've done in the UR and hard fiber, we can do things like we have redundant bricks that operate in a hot standby mode, and our relays can use the redundant bricks that operate in a hot standby mode. So if one brick is um, you know, if one if one brick is out of service for some reason, the relay uses the data from the other brick, and if I do this cross things, I have a complete reliability of measurement and protection. Right? I can do things like, you know, using it. To improve protection, this is an example of a 500 kV line that has some gas insulated bus duct going across the switch yard. The, to, for protection, you want to reclose the line, obviously, if there's a fault, unless the fault's in the bus duct, because that's assumed to be a permanent fault. So you're actually using process bus to really, all you're really doing this is protect, it's not really protection of the duct, it's really sending a blocking signal to my main line protection. So if there's a fault, the line protection will operate. The bus differential will also operate the block reclosing of, of the fault, right? And then even in some cases, so you could do um, primary backup protection, primary protection with with a process bus, backup protection with the conventional as you're waiting for multiple manufacturers to really truly support process bus in the back, right? And then, you know, other things you can do, and this is one of the great things about with process bus to go through this example. And this is a Ryan Energy, which serves New Zealand, is they're upgrading the protection and control and distribution substations and metal clad switch gear. And they wanted to do something that was fast and adaptable, could be you know, quickly rolled out to multiple substations. They wanted to address, you know, life cycle cost requirements, you know, because we know life cycle, because relays are going to last much, much shorter lifespan than the switch gear. So we have to have how to replace this going forward. I want to do this project today and not have to do it again in 15 years to do another project, right? I wanted a standard repeatable design. I wanted to focus on safety, particularly in terms of operations and arc flash. And of course, doing things like 
you know, resource utilization, so the least amount of effort to do projects possible, and of course, cost. So what Orion did is they used, you know, a process interface unit, which is the brick, the GE brick, to do every everything. They used multiple zone feeder relays, the F35 and the B30, the do. So the design becomes like this. They put their process interface units so the brick can take two sets of currents and, and so on. One for every two feeder breakers. So they have, you know, four bricks, transformer high side, transformer low side, one for every two feeder breakers. They use an F35 to do protection, phase and ground overcurrent protection and reclosing each one of the four feeders individually plus backup overcurrent protection of the bus. A B30 to do differential protection of the bus and backup overcurrent protection of each one of the four feeders individually and a T60 for transformer protection. So they wanted to design three relays and four bricks to complete substation. You know, and you look at the design, so they replace the electric mechanical release of the doors with this brand new doors. They mount the bricks in the switch gear themselves, one brick for every two sections. Cabinets in a separate components. You can test the bricks separate from the relays. You can test the relays separate test the components and connect them back together. If the pieces are working and they're talking to each other, then the whole Right, and in terms of reliability, people question one brick for every two feeders. So what you can do is put in two bricks for every two feeders and use those redundant measurements in a hot standby method, right? So my last application to talk about is smart switch gear, which becomes standard wiring to all devices and IEDs. Then I'm sending the status as information. So my brick does this, my brick does this wiring that communicates to relay somewhere else. To relays being, you know, I'm used to relays being, you know, you know, I inject current voltage in the relays and see the results, and it's all right there in the panel, right? Now I've moved the I/O across the switch yard. How do I do this? Well, the answer is the way everybody's doing right now is they move the test sets across the switch yard, do these connections, and 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 test it, which is the hard way, but it's the way we know it's based on current practices and principles. It's going to take us time to adapt to this, but the right way is not to test. It's to replace. It's replace, merge, place the I.O. devices with tested versions of the I.O. devices. Simply, you know, re, in our case, remove the brick, install a new brick that's been tested in the lab, and that brick's tested and good, and we just install it and run. You know, with relays, you can you know, you can do testing with a virtual test set, you know, to create optical signals during commissioning. Routine testing is no longer necessary because what I've done, I've removed all the I.O. and parts that fail. All that's left is the microprocessor piece, which either works or it doesn't work. We know if it doesn't work, so I don't do routine testing. Now, of course, things like NERC may not agree and we have to do it, but, you know, do end to end. To end. And a communications network, you know, for example, if if my relays are talking to the right merging units, right interface units, and so on, then, then I know the communications network's working. I don't have to test it all. It's being continuously tested because the message is being you know, published and subscribed. And I want to do testing and build. I can build a test panel for process bus where I have spare bricks. I can connect any relay to any brick in the field. I connect these spare bricks to any relay for testing and so on. And it also, also become in field spares that I can use to do this. I can patch them. Stations and six and you know GE offers solutions around 61850, right? If we look at architecture, new architecture, like legacy devices, and so on, right? So at this level in, in the transmission substation, you know we offer process bus. We have bricks, right, to do process bus. We do goose messaging. Every one of our relays does goose messaging. You know the URs, you know, will do process bus. Actually, GE somewhere down here with the, all the MND stuff, you know, does 61850 and and goose messaging, right? and we have the hard fiber and the brick. We can interface the legacy devices using the D25 and the D400. So we can, you know, if we want to do 61850 messaging, right, D25 will do goose messaging, D400 does client server. Goose messages is coming in the D400 um, as well. So we can interface the rest of our substation and old devices that support different skater protocols like Modbus and, you know, older ones. We can interface with the D25, right? Gateway and protocol conversion to SCADA using the D400, which, you know, D400 gateway, great 6150 capabilities and configuration, right? 
for remote access to cyber cure, security of cyber sentry and cyber armor, right? Okay, at this point, we don't have a 6150 HMI, but we do have, you know, power link advantage. We do have viewpoint monitoring is a very simplistic and, you know, uh, 6150 HMI. We do have power link advantage, which is a rational deployment HMI, which we can use traditional SCADA data to the DNP, and we use the D400 to supply that to us as well. So the review, right? Just an overview, and this is a lot to cover in a couple of hours, but just an overview of 61850. Right? There's powerful technical concepts in 61850. Functional modeling and protection control system. Self-description data. The real powerful thing is that we can know data and we can share data. You know, and by knowing information and sharing information, right? So we can know information, where it comes from, what it means, that we can trust it. And because we know it, we can share it with all devices, everything, right, based on, you know, functional modeling and self-description, right? And we can use share it using publish describe for like goose and sampled values. We can share it using client server reporting and the great things we can do. 61850, there also is room for improvement, right? So I talked about the goal of the standards interoperability. But interoperability is not always easy to achieve. It depends so much on how vendors have implemented 61850 in their devices and the choices they made because there's because there's always choices in how to interpret the standard, right? The design and the implementation, right? And there's also different versions of parts of the standard which cause some inner which cause some problems, right? It's almost like parts of the standard are different and an addition one device and addition two device don't work with each other, right? Um and that's one of the um interoperability challenges. Now, a lot of the interoperability is going to be fixed as everything matures and you have common information, the standard, people do projects and so on. But, you know, there it is. Configuration tools for 61850 are atrocious, right? They're rudimentary. They don't do everything. They're the, one of the big limiting factors for, for imp implementing 61850. So I did, went through the whole design process and the 628 you know, top-down functional design and I do a substate, you know, I come up with an SCD file. There is no tool that does an adequate job of producing an SCD file today in existence, right? You know, the system configuration tools don't really exist right now. And there's gonna be a long time before they do it because there's a whole business case problem for vendors to do it, right? You don't necessarily need a system configuration tool for Goose applications, but you do for almost everything else. And it's a limitation right now. And a lot of vendors have tools that work really well at their stuff, but not so much with other people's stuff and have problems, and have other challenges to them addressed, right? Cybersecurity is an issue for 61850 because it was never addressed in the standard. We did this, you know, 15 years ago the, in, the, in the early days of network communication, how great it was, and we, we ignored that you know there are people that always want that do malicious things for for their own reasons, right? And cybersecurity needs to be addressed. And then testing, the whole issue of testing in sixty one eight fifty, you know the you know addition, you know the, the the second edition of parts of the standards addresses testing, but there's still the testing tools are, are still issues, and it's the whole concepts and philosophy about how we do testing. And I mentioned it before, but we change from isolating the device to taking the device under test and isolating from the system, which is the way we do things today, and changing it to taking the device under test and isolating the system from this device, which is a big change in philosophy. I really have to think about how we're going to do that and how we're going to do it going forward. So there's my condensed overview of 61850 in an hour and a half, right? And this is, you know, it does a lot. And I covered a lot of ground quickly. So if this, this is not intended to be the be all and end all presentation. We're really talking about, you know, what 61850 is, what you can do with it, why you may want to do it, some examples of what you can do with it and so on. And the next part is, okay, now I've done the easy part. This is why you could do it, what you could do with it. Now the, the hard part is actually doing an actual project with it. So thanks and talk to you soon.